looks like a devil, man, a demon. And this thing is, is big. And the next thing I know, it was right over top of us. Three, two, one. Welcome back to the Lost Frequency Podcast. I'm Tom. And I'm Rai. And today we have on Thomas Seawood. So we want to welcome Thomas to the Lost Frequency Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on. All right, Thomas. Thanks for being on. Thanks for being on. <laughs> um, so why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and where they can find you and go ahead. So I'm well known for Sasquatch Island. That's my uh, Facebook group and my YouTube channel. And uh, what it is, is it's just basically my encounters with Sasquatch, my beliefs, perspectives, and experiences. Uh, because back in the day, I guess up until about the 2015 area, I basically lived and worked out on the waters of British Columbia, uh, coastal British Columbia and uh, lived in bush for decades uh, you know I was a hunting guide for quite a few years uh, I did ecotourism operations I was commercial fisherman so I was always in the inlets off of northeastern Vancouver Island British Columbia harvesting everything from shrimp called prawns the big ones the crab the clams uh, other fish species you know and You'd anchor out at night in a bay, and all of a sudden you'd hear screaming up on the hill or in the forest, and maybe a big bang, tree knock, and you just dump your coffee over the side of this boat, and okay, time to go to bed now. And you know, <laughs> it was a Sasquatch, you know, but no big deal, you know. And when I was out in bush, there's times where you know I'd smell them, I knew they were around me, and. Uh, my bush experience, because I loved it so much, and I was a square peg in a round hole when it come to living in the cities. So I spent all my time that I could out in the bush world and water world and, you know, being a hunting guide for spring and uh, fall, you know, mainly bear is what I targeted, black bear and grizzly bear. That was my specialty was grizzly bears. I just loved hunting those and still do. Wow. But anyway, you're out there and... To me, Sasquatches are just another critter out there that leaves tracks, uh, leaves steaming coilers of poop on the beach or the trail. <laughs> and from time to time, you see, hear, see or hear them or smell them for sure. But you respected them. You just, you know, you knew they're about. So you just, if they made a tree knock or shook a tree, threw something at you, left broken shellfish on the high tide part of a beach, you just backed away, got out of there. Because they're telling you that we're here right now. We don't want you here, you filthy, rotten, hairless, bipedal creature. They hate we humans, <laughs> you know, and you can't blame them. Look what we're doing to our environment, which is their environment as well. Fracking, clear cutting, urban sprawl, pollution, the list goes on. And, you know, even now in the Pacific Northwest, I can imagine what it's like being a Sasquatch, seeing the salmon rivers in collapse because we've overfished them. And shellfish beaches are dug out and there's no shellfish left in some areas. So that's the main reason why I believe why they don't come near us. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, how come they don't come sit with us at our fires? I'm like, well, if you hate, despise, and loathe someone, are you going to go sit with them and have a coffee with them? No, you're going to avoid them at all costs. And that's what the Sasquatches are to us. So I guess, you know, fill you in, like a lot of people, you know, starting to listen to me and they're like, oh, Christ, this guy's a bushman. He's got some experience. Well, the main experience I have with Sasquatch is I'm a Kwakwakiwak 
First Nation or Coastal Indian from northeastern Vancouver Island, British Columbia. When you go to Vancouver Island, especially up in the north, it's like watching the movie King Kong and you see all the effigies of Kong carved into wood and rock and everything. That's Vancouver Island. It's the highest concentration of wood carvings of Chunahua, Wild Woman of the Woods, the highest ranked crest of the Kwakwakiwak tribe, my people. So not only do you see the big memorial totem poles in uh, graveyards with outstretched arms of a figure with big breasts and puckered up lips and sleepy eyes, that's Chunahua at the base of the pole, the most powerful position because it's the highest ranked crest. And displaying the Chonokha, be it in Vancouver Stanley Park, where you see the memorial pole where the squatting Chonokha has outstretched arms. That tells a Kwakwaki walk that that pole that, that was carved for a chief who died, he had title to the highest rank crest of the Kwakwaki walk level of crest tier structure, the Chonokha. And with outstretched arms, it's telling us that not only was he wealthy in crest, but he also, his power and wealth could be felt around the world. That's what the outstretched arms are. So get into places like Campbell River on the eastern central side of Vancouver Island. You go behind the grocery store downtown, and uh, there's a memorial graveyard there with a beautiful Chonokha pole carving on the base of one of the p- memorial poles. You drive through the town, and there's carvings of Sasquatch with a basket on her back with an infant, or it could be representing spoiled, rotten, misbehaving, nasty little children. You know, like a kid that we didn't want to just slap upside the head and say, God, get the hell out of here. Get back to your mother. I don't want to listen to your whining and sniveling. And that's what we kids were told. And we still do that to our younger kids. We tell them. You just remember when you're out here in the edge of the forest or out clam digging on a beach or a boat you always remember that chona was watching you a female sasquatch she's not allowed to touch you but if you misbehave she's going to run out at night and when you're sleeping she's going to stick big hairy arm in through the window or the porthole of the boat or the tent and she's going to grab you and rub spruce sap from a tree in your eyes like like uh Putty and it's going to make you blind and she's going to throw you in her basket on her back or she's going to stuff you in a big sack that's woven from cedar bark fibers or spruce root fibers which was you know how we used to make you know clothing and baskets and you name it back in the day and we still do for uh, collectors and traditional uh, regalia but anyway you're put into that basket or that sack and you're brought deep into the forest where she'll go up a mountain to her invisible home Think about it. That's why we can't find Sasquatch. And that's where Chonokha boil up a misbehaving child and eat him right to the bone. So you behave yourself. So Sasquatch was my boogeyman as a kid. And my two children, who are now, you know, 19 and 22, I brought them up about Chonokha to, you know, behave themselves. We were always in the bush. I was running sea kayaking and bear watching operations with cabins and boats. See, and uh, we were always in the bush. My kids grew up out there, and you know they they'd be acting up, and I'm like, "Hey, you behave yourself." Tuna was watching. Oh, well, they'd smarten right up, you know. So <laughs> that's kind of where I come from. I come from a people, an area of the planet, uh, west corner of the Pacific Northwest of what I call Sasquatch Island, which is North America. A lot of people go, oh, Vancouver Island, Sasquatch Island. And I'm like, no, it's actually Ape Island. Sasquatch Island, you're standing on it, North America. You know, that's my hat, Sasquatch Island. And what it is, is every Indian tribe throughout North America, which the Indians at one time before and even now call Turtle Island. Why do we call it Turtle Island? Well. The Aleutian Islands, the Hudson's Bay in the north is the mouth of the turtle. Labrador and Newfoundland, eastern Canada is the other flipper. Baja, California is a flipper. Florida is a flipper. Mexico and Central America is the tail. That's Turtle Island. How my ancestors knew it looked like a turtle from space, I'm not getting there. This is a Sasquatch podcast. But anyway, <laughs> I call it Sasquatch. We, 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 well, well just, just to give you a heads up, Thomas, we are an everything podcast. So I find that fascinating, find too. It. You know, that is just amazing. 
yeah. well, you guys have me on here till midnight and we start talking UFOs. <laughs> and, but anyway, that's why I call it Sasquatch Island. My group on Facebook, my YouTube channel, my website, my film production operations, because everyone in North America, whether you're an Indian tribe who has a name or a story, a belief about Sasquatch, or you have uh, non-Indians that live here, and we've yep. been sharing the continent since uh, Christopher Columbus or the Vikings got lost in the fog coming out of Europe. But anyway, we all have stories of Sasquatch. We all have names, the non-Indians, Jersey Devil, uh, Grass Man, and the list goes on. So I call North America Sasquatch Island because it's on like Donkey Kong when it comes to Sasquatches <laughs> out there. Right. That was hilarious. I love how the Vikings got lost. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's what we always say. Worst of the like, species got lost in the fog and showed up here. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good place to start, but you said you've run across Sasquatch excrement. What could you describe what that looks like? Being a bushman, and you know what, what does that look like? It just looks like grizzly bear or big black bear poo. And but yeah. usually I've noticed that it's usually you know elongated, like they're walking and they just do their business as they're walking. So it's uh, <laughs> No, no time, no time Sausage. for shit. Just yeah. keep going. Yeah, no, no big, yeah, no Sasquatch toilets. You know, <laughs> what you got to look for is uh, when you when Sas Sasquatches are seasonal nomadic people of the other tribe. Okay. So I heard this. yes, they're like a lot of people. Like I just roll my eyes and think, how stupid can humans be when you hear, oh, do you think maybe there's more than one Sasquatch? And I'm just like, give your head a shake. Look at Vancouver Island. Every salmon river on Vancouver Island with the tributaries where salmon spawn. Well, it adds up to about 271 salmon producing rivers and streams on Vancouver Island. Every major river will have a clan of Sasquatches and subclans. The subclans will be out in the estuaries. So if we look at uh, groupings of a family of three or four to one individual who's living on its own sasquatch but they all belong to a river system clan group you know i'm talking within a couple of 300 miles nothing too longer than that but then if you average just 1.5 you get a number of well over 1600 sasquatches on vancouver island alone and then when you research investigate like i do and you do so many uh interviews with people who've seen sasquatches and you start finding out size and coloration one has one eye one has a limp and so forth you find that they're just like any other indian they have their clan territories with their salmon producing river their shellfish bed their alpine areas for the june july august fawn drop where all the fawns of the ungulates are up on the alpines getting away from the forest fires it's just us dumb hairless bipedal creatures that live in the valleys and see our houses and towns burnt to the ground because a forest fire swept through sasquatch is far superior in thinking than we are so they just live up on the alpine in the summer and they see a forest fire it's going to smoke them out or doesn't usually go in the alpines because there's so much dew up there then they'll just go down the mountain across the river up the other side of the valley into the next alpine and watch a forest fire go by so i know all this because in the early 1990s desert storm started and i was given an ultimatum by the police in vancouver island to uh stick around and you're going to be in trouble or um you know if you know i was thinking jesus maybe it's time to get out of dodge then i caught my girlfriend fooling around on me with my best friend and that settled it i'm out of here so i packed my stuff in the storage locker i got my cousin to bring me out into our traditional territories off northeastern vancouver island and I like to say I walked into the bush and I never turned around to look what I left. And roughly nine years later is when I came back out, started living back in town, you know, because I was off grid. You know, I live on boats and commercial fish. And I lived on a 96, 97 foot fiberglass, beautiful yacht when I was a hunting guide in spring and uh, fall hunts. So I had the uh, life of Riley out there, you know, when you're out in bush, you don't worry about bills. You don't worry about girlfriends because kayak season's coming up and you can't put a fat chick in a kayak and they all wear spandex. So I was in heaven, <laughs> you know, why the hell would I want to come live in concrete? And then of course you're out there and you see signs of Sasquatch yeah. and you know, you know, they're about, and you, you know, you will just, uh, be out at night and sometimes when i was out by myself i wouldn't have a fire 
because I was constantly like a Sasquatch hunting and harvesting. So I didn't want to have that bird or that animal smell me. And if I smelled like a camper and all smoky, I wasn't going to get close to most animals. So hardly ever would I have a fire unless it was for cooking. And I would always ensure that it was upwind from that fire. And I always had clothes ready to get changed and wash them in a creek or a lake so that and rub them with cedar boughs or hemlock boughs, so spruce boughs, so I neutralized my stink so I could be, you know, in harmony with the environment. Yeah. That's what Sasquatches do. And if they came near my camp at night, I would just go, yo, weeks us. In my language, that means, hello, how are you doing? I don't know who you are. And then I'd, Wigilas, Tunafa. What are you up to, Sasquatch? And you'd hear, oh, no, Higman, oh, no, no. and they just walk off. That's the respect. They knew I was out there. I knew they're out there. And, you know, looking at your reaction to that. So when you get these arrogant bubbas that, you know, usually aren't Indian, because us Indians all know Sasquatch exists, and there's no such thing as Sasquatch. You guys are so full of it. That's why your eyes are brown. And, you know, <laughs> I don't believe in Sasquatch. I'm a logger. I'm a forester. I'm a prospector. I'm a mushroom picker. I'm a hiker. You know, I'm always in the bush. I've never seen or heard a Sasquatch. You guys are full of malarkey and beans. And I look at him, I go, you well, you do hunting, right? And working out there? Well, of course. You ever notice sometimes you might hear something, you turn around and all of a sudden there's a branch bouncing, but there's right. no cougar cub, no raccoon, no bear cub, no bird. And yeah, why? Well, at Sasquatch, you're called the watcher. They pull a branch down, they look at you. That's why we Indians call Sasquatch the watcher, and they'll show you something. Oh, no, I had a painting, but it's not there. But anyway, Sasquatch watches you. And if you're sitting there looking where each footfall has to go, you're wearing REI mountain equipment co-op, and you got a pack sack all colorful with a plastic tube going to your mouth and some stupid <laughs> company hat for some big camping outfit and you're wearing a bear bell and you smell like cologne and underar underarm stuff and you're slipping and tripping well the sasquatch looks and goes well, that person's not comfortable out in this environment you know it's a city i you know so yeah. hiker so they just watch and leave it but then they look and they watch someone like me that bush dances, what looks and puts the next dozen or so foot uh, footfalls down, but doesn't have to look where every step goes. Works like the breeze in the bush. And, you know, they're just in their environment. They're comfortable. And they might be wearing camel, which I don't ever recommend. And if you're Sasquatch investigating, it's just my brand for when I'm in the city and not in the bush. But we'll get to that later. But anyway, the Sasquatch looks at you and says, you're a bush dancer. It then pulls the branch down further and turns and walks away and the branch bounces. And you turn and look and no animal, no bird. What it is is a Sasquatch saying, I saw you, I'm here too. I've gone about my business and respect you. I expect the same. And then you'll look at that non-Indian, non-believer go, damn, come to think of it, Tom, I've seen that probably half a dozen times in my career doing what I do in the bush. Then the little light bulb goes off because that's why they're not seeing. They're a perceived threat. They're comfortable in the forest bush setting. So yeah. to a Sasquatch, they're not stupid. And with someone wearing camo and got a rifle on their shoulder or a pistol on their side, well, if they don't have that, they're going to have a knife because who the hell goes to the bush without a knife? You know, you, you know, most bush, all bushers know. I'm, if I'm going to the bush, number one, I'm going to have a gun. If I don't yeah. have a gun, I will have my pig sticker on my side and my jackknife in my pocket or on my belt. So the yep. Sasquatches know this, and that's why they respect us and don't want to interact with us. You know, you got to remember that they are the humans of the night. So when we go to bed at night and turn off the sports channel on TV, shut our bathroom light off and our nightstand night, and next thing you know, half an hour later, we're farting and rem seating and snoring away, the Sasquatches know, because they got good years, and they've cased us out because it's their territory, our property is in their territory, they know that while you're snoring and farting upstairs or in the bedroom, 
it's time to go capitalize on human produced proteins. And that's where they go into the greenhouses, opposable thumbs. They can get their way into a greenhouse with a doorknob or a latch or a twisted wire. They go into the feed shed for the poultry or the hoofed animals you have. They go into your compost. Can you imagine Sasquatch going to 10 compost a night in the urban edge and lifting the lid and all of a sudden looking in there and going, I don't know what these are called, but they're orange a little bit. And what we would throw away because it's mushy, a cantaloupe or a melon or a watermelon or honeydew to yeah. a Sasquatch that doesn't see that because they don't grow naturally in the Pacific Northwest. To them, it's a delicacy. It's like us opening up a cooler and it's filled with lobster and king crab and big, huge fillet steaks. We're just going to gorge ourselves because that's what a compost is to a Sasquatch. They get 12 months of the year, potato peelings, soft tomatoes, uh, all the different offcuts that we throw out of our fridge. 40 to 60% of the food we buy ends up in the garbage or compost. So you can imagine why when you hear about, boy, getting a lot of listeners talking about our speakers coming on our show, talking about how they live at the urban edge and we're to get and seeing an increase in Sasquatch activity at the edge of their suburbs or small farms. Well, no doubt we're producing 12 months a year protein for the Sasquatch. And, you know, we can get into conspiracy theater, th theories where I've seen video of a Sasquatch running with a night vision flur from a helicopter and i'm talking high end and that sasquatch is running to the right to the left to the right to the left it jumps over a creek about 15 feet wide as it's looking up at the helicopter you see in the flur the hair moving the muscle movement the fear on its face and the screen went blurry i watched it six times a couple of three years ago and i gave the man back his iphone and i said that sasquatch was machine gunned after that and he goes yeah he goes the military's taking them out and why that's why we're now seeing an increase of sasquatches on our urban edges they're coming to live close to us because they know those helicopters can't get them at night no way they're going to let their machine guns go or their rotor blades Hey, look at you two. I see your frontal lobes starting to fire in unison like a 396 Corvette motor. <laughs> it's all, I, I think so, if you're not going to do us, if you're not going to do any type of podcast about Sasquatch, you should definitely do one about comedy because you got me over here in stitches half the time. I'm farting upstairs while I'm sleeping, sleeping and farting. All right, Tom. <laughs> Well, uh, most podcasts, I've, you know, everyone goes, oh, did you listen to this person or that person? I'll tell you the truth. I don't listen to podcasts or video casts. I find most of the speakers dry as a popcorn fart that they interview. So <laughs> to me, you know, I live the life. You know, why should I have to listen to someone who's had a little bit of experience or fumbling and stumbling in the forest comes up with a speculation about Sasquatches? They cloak. They fly in, hello, in UFOs. They can jump through portholes. They can turn into an orb. What a crock of BS. And the person's so full of BS when they talk about that, their eyes should be brown. You know, that's the way I look at all that woo-woo stuff when it pertains to Sasquatch. They get so shit scared when they're out there and they see a Sasquatch. The next thing you know, the mental band-aid kicks in and they saw it flying a UFO or jumping through a porthole or turning into an orb. It's like people that get sexually abused. Do you ever hear them talk, sit down and, oh, by the way, I haven't seen you in three months. Did I tell you about when I was sexually abused when I was a teenager? They don't do that. They shut it down. It's their mind's way of kicking the mental Band-Aid in so they don't have to keep reciting it all the time. And the ones that do, they got to go in for counseling and therapy, you know, which I feel bad for them. But, you know, a tra trauma is trauma. So the mental yeah. Band-Aid kicks in. And that's what all the woo-woo is to me. Because I've been out right. in the bush, and I've been around many Sasquatches, and I've never seen them do any of that woo-woo crap. They leave crap. They leave footprints. You see them harvesting. They leave broken shells. They make noise to warn you to turn around and get out of there. Never seen them turn into an orb or jump through a portal or cloak or jump in a UFO. So it's all got to be in malarkey and BS as far as I'm concerned. All derived from the mental band-aid. Got so shit scared they started freaking out. So Tom, could you maybe go into like maybe like some of these experiences and explain to us what 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 you've been seeing from because I think you have a very interesting point of view that I think a lot of people should be listening to. I'm super interested being a man in the bush. I'm also off grid here in Mexico. Not quite like you, though. I think you definitely went all in. Uh, I got solar power, so I, I guess I'm not quite as cool as you are, I guess. But uh, I would love to hear, like, 
not only your perspective, but as well as uh, also what you've been seeing and why you feel that way. Don't get me wrong. When I was off grid, I had generators. I had a float house, I had boats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there, so, there you go. But there were right. other times where I was under a tarp in a hammock for weeks, months on end. Yeah, so you yeah, know, yeah, I did yeah. both areas. You yeah, know, yeah, don't me. get me <laughs> don't get me wrong. You know, bush is bush. But now I'm older. I can't be doing what I used to do when I was younger. But when I was younger, I was out there, and uh, you know, we'd uh, be up in the alpines because my cousin i used to hang out with and they're a lot younger he really liked going in the alpines so he'd find out he was heavy fetal alcohol syndrome so he couldn't really hold a job where i was commercial fishing working for our fishing game doing salmon enumerations from a helicopter counting salmon during this time of the year and uh whatever else i was doing to make a paycheck and uh you know, all of a sudden he'd find out through the Moccasin Telegraph on the res that, oh, Tommy's not working. And he'd come sift me out in Campbell River. Let's go up to the bush. Yeah, okay, let's go. We'd pack our coffee and our uh, cigarettes and our knife and our little fishing gear and our blanket and tarp and hammock. And off we'd go, you know, and we'd see other hikers sometimes and they have like 60 pound packs and they're sweating away and we just shake our head. <laughs> and they'd be all, Silly, what are you doing bringing all that stuff to the bush for everything you need is in the bush and on the beaches so anyway we go out there and you know you come in and have some firewood and you sit down and they're watching me and what the jonah uh, they watch they got a couple of them on us i can see them every now and then he was looking at me and this would go on and i used to think sometimes oh he's pulling my leg but then all of a sudden at night, you'd smell that rotten human body odor times 30. And you'd think, oh, man, you'd know it was a Sasquatch. Or you'd hear it, and it'd always be downwind from you. So it's just a very few times you'd smell them when they were, one of them was right. coming over, circumventing you, or basically doing their recon on you. They're master SEAL team operators. They're constantly in recon, doing re their reconnaissance, especially when you're out there as a human in deep. And... Uh, you know, it, after a few years, I figured it out. I was non-fetal alcohol syndrome. You know, I'm a thinker. And I was the one barking the orders to my cousin. And there's my cousin kind of, you know, got that sort of what I lethargic look. And uh, I think that's what they picked up on. You know, there's a less a chance of anything negative happening from my cousin than me. And that's why he would see them. But we would know they're mm -hmm. about. And then he passed tragically uh, over a decade and a half ago. But anyway, uh, I was in Omaha Indian Reserve. And I often, I always talk about British Columbia on my encounters. But I went to Omaha Indian Res Reservation in uh, Macy, Nebraska. Um, went with one of the groups that's out there on Facebook. I don't associate with them no more. But anyway, I met a guy there named Lucas White, tribe member long braided hair glasses as soon as i saw him he's like hey you go to smoke so i gave him a cigarette <laughs> and we became friends and he's still part of my team but while lucas and i were down there in the daytime i was doing a, in my second trip back to the reservation i was contracted for two weeks to do a tourism analysis and a report for the omaha tribe so during the day we we're driving around and uh, doing reconnaissance for potential tourism operations for the tribe and then we finish about 4 35 o'clock and go to sleep have that siesta because you want to get back into the sasquatch life they're humans of the night so we i'd wake up you know hour and a half into dark and uh, have a quick bite and off lucas and i would go in the pickup truck using the flur on my cell phone and you know bingo and sasquatches which they call sitonga left right and center oh i got piles of blurry sasquatch flur images is this uh sorry thomas is this is this particular area like two and a half hours north of omaha nebraska hour and 40 i think okay I've, i think i've heard of this area there's a oh yeah it's a on lot of donkey count oh yeah yeah i heard it is super active it's on a reserve yeah uh, it's, yeah well i went up the uh, in case people want to go with them, I'll give them a little plug. You know, the Red Squatching, they're Red who squatching. invited me there. Yes. Yeah, but they're so full of BS, their eyes are brown, and that's because they're Indians. But anyway, 
they brought me there and then his sister, a council member, contracted me to do the tourism analysis and I hooked up with Lucas. And uh, Lucas is our boots on the ground. And when I met him and I came back to the Pacific Northwest, I emailed Dr. John Bindernagel, my famous investigator, my dear friend when he was alive, Jeff Meldrum, Les Stroud, and uh, Todd Neese from the American Primate Conservancy. And the title of the email was, I Found Tarzan. And Lucas, when he was a young boy, was living with his father at the edge of town out in the rural area. And he came home and his dad was wouldn't wake up, sitting in a chair, laid back, arms outstretched. Dad, dad, wake up, wouldn't wake up. So he ran a mile and a half down the road to his neighbors. They came back, put a blanket on their, his dad and said, sorry, Lucas, but your dad has passed. Looks like a heart attack. So the police, oh. of course, come and the social services. What do we Indians hate and despise? Police. Police take our parents or, and uh, social services take our children. Yeah. So they both come to the house. Lucas is brought to his mother's in town who's uh, living a bad lifestyle. And uh, anyway, she's like, okay, I never wanted to look after you, Lucas, or any of your brothers or sisters, but you're here now. I guess I got to look after you. Go have a bath. There'll be food on the table. So when he got out of the bath, there was a bowl of uh, cereal on the table, milk, so and a coloring book. So he sat down and was eating and coloring. All of a sudden, he heard something. He looked at the back porch. Police officer. So he jumped up and ran to the front door, and there's a police officer and a social worker and his mom. Oh. I can't do this, Lucas. I can't do this. So Lucas is taken 20 plus miles off the reserve, put into a non Indian elderly farmhouse couple to be foster parents. You'll go to school in the morning, yada, yada, yada. That night, he steals some money and some food and some blankets, and he runs away. It takes him two and a half days. And he's got, remember, he's got kids about 10 years old. Takes him two and a half days to get back to the Omaha Indian Reservation, the Macy. Tries to interact with his cousins. Of course, the parents don't want him around because he's a, you know, juvenile uh, on the run. And Lucas, you can't be here. Take me and my husband, your uncle, or my children. So go away. So he did his thing, and after couple of days of this and nights sleeping in an abandoned house, his grandfather said, Lucas, you know what to do? Go out into the bush. Look for the houses where people died that turned into uh, memorials where we put blankets and food in there and candles from time to time for them to use in the spirit world. You use what we put out there. So there are islands out there in the middle of a field. There's a house inside that island of trees. There's canned food, dried food, blankets and things. So that's where Lucas would live and he would interact this one night with this big sitonga, a Sasquatch, would right. come to this broken down house and lean on the wall and he covered himself with a blanket. And when all of a sudden he started hearing humming, the sitonga was singing to him, the Sasquatch, big male. So it was a clan leader. Yeah. And I said, Lucas, what'd you do? He goes, well, I lifted the blanket and I looked and it was a wall, you know, where they have wood and they have a strip of wood between the crack. I said, yeah, it's called board and batten. He goes, well, okay, well, the... The, I guess the battens were out and his hair was sticking through the crack. I said, what'd you do? He goes, oh, I felt it and I, I smelled it. When he did that, I knew I had found Tarzan. He'd lived with the apes, so to speak, because uh. at night when we were investigating, he'd crouch down like a little orangutan or a, what we call a bakus, the little people, the hair-covered bipedal creatures that aren't Sasquatch. They're a different creature. Another podcast. But anyway, they go, <laughs> he's, he tells me this. So I said, there's no way. And you would live there from, you lived there until October when it got cold. You walked into Macy, police got a hold of you, brought you to foster care. You stayed in school, did your foster care responsibilities as a Kid went to school, did your chores, and uh, March stole money from them and blankets and food and took off again for the bush of Macy and lived there every March until October until he was 18, an adult. So he was no longer under foster care. I said, Lucas, there's no bloody way a young kid, young teenager could live out there with the wild dogs and the different animals out there that can kill you. And I said, You lived with the Sasquatches. They have laws, Tom, very strict laws. They have language. They have culture. They have this. They're basically us 
they're just the other tribe, the humans of the night. Where we sleep, they harvest and hunt and live. When we are awake, they are sleeping. That's why, so we don't clash together. And he put his head down, he looked up. I have lots to tell you, but they have laws, Tom, very strict laws. So he had to go in the last couple of years and interact with the clan leader who looked after him as a young boy. And this is decades ago. So I asked him a question, how old, how long do Sasquatches live? He says, well, Sitonga, Omaha, our name means keeper of the medicine. And all of a sudden, the little light bulb went off. How our shamans from my tribe and other tribes would disappear into the bush for months, years on end. And they would come back with the knowledge on the medicinal plants and remedies and poultices to look after the tribe members in the village. They were living with the Sasquatches, learning all those things, and they still do. So that's why they call them Sitonga, keepers of the medicine. That's why we Indians refer to them as always give them respect don't you ever think of shooting them or killing them you know like these yahoos and camel on television chasing sasquatch to shoot them with all their rifles and shotguns you know man those guys got to be put in hooskow they got to be put in jail that's murder what they're trying mm -hmm. to do and uh, i so, agree yeah and that's why how our indians are but in omaha we were pulling out at night to go investigate and that's when i was with the uh, Barry from Red Squatching uh, was the second time I went down there. And when I got in his car, like any Indian Res wagon, it's all filled with candy wrappers and fast food containers and bags. <laughs> but I saw a box that said Fleur Scout 2 and a green mono scout. Yeah. So when we're pulling out of the cabins in the Indian Reserve along the Missouri River, and it's all we're for, um, farm area and everything rural. And uh, I go, hey, didn't you have a fleur? He goes, yeah, it's in the back there somewhere. So I'm digging through all the garbage and I pull out this fleur. I said, how do you turn it on? He goes, I don't know. I never read the instructions. It's one of one of the buttons up top, push it. And it'll say calibrating. So here's me, the Indian. Read the instructions. Don't be an Indian. I'm pushing buttons. And finally, oh, it's calibrating. <laughs> so as I'm looking, I'm like, holy smokes, white man's magic. Boy, you can sure see good with this one. I'd never <laughs> tried one before. No offense to the listeners if you're not Indian. And this emphasizes the point. How impressed I was with this thing that just brought night into daylight. And all of a sudden, I'm like, stop, stop, stop. And I'm looking over out the driver's side window because it's open. You can't look. Use flur through glass. And there's this two big Sasquatches just walking like 60, 80 yards out in the field. And it rained the night before. So I, from Pacific Northwest, it's probably going to be a mushy field. We can't drive in there. So anyway, I'm like, holy smokes, it's a pregnant female and a big male. And I gave the fleur to Barry. And Barry grabs it. Oh, yeah, two Sitonga. And he gives it back to me. And I look. They'd done a 90-degree angle while he was looking. And now they just walk into the forest. And he went and they got with his arms. And they just disappeared. Forest closed behind them. And I was like, holy smokes, I just got to see two Sasquatches in the fleur. Pregnant female, big male, but what really stuck with me is that hang lip. Looked like Bubba Gump's buddy in uh, Forrest Gump. Yeah, and really? A Cro-Magnon look, which is differed from the look of the face and just the way they walk, the slow, loping way. Reminded me of my cousin and others who have fetal alcohol syndrome. And I said... They're freaking inbreeding in the Indian Reserve because all around the Omaha Indian Reserve, which is made up in the southeast of the Omaha tribe, the Ho-Chunk Omaha and the Winnebago Omaha, three different factions of their tribe in that big forested enclave, Google Earth, Omaha Indian Reservation. They'll see what I mean. And then all around it is exterminated forest for industrial farmlands. And that enclave of forest is where the Sasquatches are taking shelter and living. And it's so thick with Sasquatches on the Omaha Indian Reserve, they have a curfew by the tribes, so no human is out between 11 o'clock at night and 7 in the morning. And so there's no interaction between the hairless, filthy bipedals, us who live by the day, and Sitonga, the Sasquatch, the human of the night. So 
you know, it's an area that's rich. I personally think if we're going to get the conclusive video proof of Sasquatch, it's going to come from Omaha Indian Reservation. And Lucas and I, I book him for expeditions. He has permission from the chief and council to break curfew and be out in someone's vehicle or rented vehicle because he doesn't have one. But you just go pick up, go to Macy, Nebraska. Lucas will set it up where he'll be at the gas station smoking a cigarette when you get there. And uh, when you do get there, don't use plastic and don't use checks cash on the barrel head he's an indian like me we don't even have bank accounts so anyway he'll walk in the store he'll buy a bunch of cigarettes and food and then as he jumps in your vehicle he'll say go over there across the street and he'll deliver the food to his kids and because he doesn't live with them with his mom their his ex and then he'll go investigating with you through the night and day and he'll teach you so much and you will see that. sasquatch I want to do that. So that, that sounds, I mean, the way you describe that makes me absolutely want to go now. Yeah. I was too. always like, Oh, I'm kind of afraid, but this, the, the perspective that you're giving me on it from lack of a better term, from a native point of view, a point of view that I wouldn't have is much more comforting and it's much more insightful. And we knowledge is also not only is it power, but it's also, it's comforting. And to have somebody who's like, yeah, come on with me. It, it's, uh, yeah, I would. Yeah, and it, it, yeah. The back. way you're describing it is so happenstance. It's just like, just, just, just the way it is. And yeah, we're gonna save up and go. Yeah. <laughs> no, you come out with me. You go, oh, Lucas. Goodness. You're gonna have to be dump, dropping your drawers and squatting in the forest and using leaves. <laughs> Clean I'm up. Fine with that. Come I'm fine with, with that. And sleep in the habit. You come with me. We're gonna go jump on a boat. Like this is prime Sasquatch season for me now. October. Oh, wow. All the. Uh, the pretty the rains i look up and i see clouds here over kent washington and clouds moving from the southeast the fall winters upon us so right now a lot of the rivers are a lot of the sasquatches don't have tidal territory that has a salmon producing river so what they are not started doing a few weeks ago is swimming out to the shellfish beaches or traveling to the shellfish beaches for clams, cockles, mussels, barnacles, limpets, chitons, baby crabs under the rocks, washed in dead sea creatures, and you name it. And uh, so anyway, those Sasquatches are going to establish their shellfish territories. But then soon the big rains are going to come at the, towards the end of October and the monsoons and the rivers blow out and it's hard to catch salmon that are because it's tapering down anyway, salmon spawning season at the end of October into November. That's when the rest of the Sasquatch clans in October are swimming out to the islands. When they get out there, they start and answer one over there, another one answers there. No different than us when all of a sudden I go to commercial fishing, travel 200 miles up coast, go to Prince Rupert, walk in a bar to shoot some pool and drink some suds. Next thing you know, I'm like, hey, hey. Said, come over here where you been what do you do all winter hey us crow magnons do it when we're in the bar why wouldn't sasquatches do it hollering that i'm back here i am this is me let's sit down and have a chit chat together and chatter chatter like a couple sasquatches and that's why they vocalize this time of the year and so and on the friday the 13th we can't launch from a home port with our commercial fish, ex commercial fish boat. We, my friend has, my cousin, because it's bad luck that something bad will happen. So I got him Thursday the 12th, traveling from his home port of Alert Bay across the Vancouver Island to Port McNeil. So that Friday the 13th, we're all going to jump onto his 55 foot wood boat with five bunks downstairs, and we'll put a big six person tent on the back deck. The booms down, we'll have a tarp over it for the rain. And we're going to go out like we do all the time. We're going to do Sasquatch investigating. We're going to anchor out off of a shellfish beach during the, as the tide's falling, we're going to go out and dig some shellfish and then leave before it's zero, before it's right low tide. And the reason yeah. for is when you're a commercial clam digger, a lot of us will hit the beach and we'll put the boat out there at about three hours before low tide on the beach and it'll dry up. And then we start digging a little bit. And you see the young guys are digging away and sweating and digging and throwing shellfish. And us older guys are smoking cigarettes and BSing away and a little bit of a dig. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it gets low tide and the tide turns to come in. And it starts coming up the sand pretty fast, almost like a river sometimes. And the clams know that. So they swim to the surface so they can stick their siphons up and suck all that fresh water and nutrients coming in. Well, as old clam diggers, we know that. 
So all the young guys are sitting there all sweaty and huffing and puffing, all burned out. Now we sit there in big leg hell as the tide's rising for the next hour and a half, two hours, fill our sacks, go back to the boat, and then go to sleep. So that's how we commercial and food fish clam duck. Well, we do that in Sasquatch investigating. We dig so that the Sasquatches are looking from the forest going, hey, look at those dumb hairless buggers. They're digging when the tide's still falling. Boy, they don't know how to dig clams. And then all of a sudden, just before low tide, we jump in the boat, keep it floating, and we go back to the big boat with the skiff. And then we get our flurs, and then the Sasquatches come out as the tide's rising, and we bingo the Sasquatches with night vision out on the beaches. Wow. So this is the investigating I do. So that way, when you need to take a squat, we got a toilet inside. We got <laughs> propane so a, you can have coffee. That was got a, a long circle, Tom. Yeah. That was a long circle of a story. You're going to make sure that I can poop correctly. That sounds like a good deal. <laughs> coffee and poop. Nothing, right, <laughs> nothing more miserable than a bunged up white guy out in the bush with you because they're too scared to take a squat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I, I went to bathroom. What was it? I think three two two months before I have uh, before I have a not a proper toilet, but I use a bucket and compost. But I just didn't have it, so if, I'm fine with it. I, I I sleep in a hammock every night, so I'm just the mosquitoes here will kill you. I live in the jungle yeah. down here, so. But uh, I, both of them sound good to me. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. We're gonna have to see, Tom. We're gonna be in Omaha. Or we're gonna go up to. Uh, I never been to uh, Canada, but sure. Yeah, and then Seattle, like I live half an hour south of Seattle when I'm not up in Canada doing Sasquatch investigating. I've retired from commercial fishing. I just got too old, 45 plus years commercial fishing. I'm so busted up and beat up, it's not funny. I got to go work out every day. That's why I've lost 80 pounds in the last year and a half. Oh, I got nice. to ended up being... Oh, yeah, I was FBI, man. I was a friggin' big Indian. I had more chins than a Hong Kong phone book. <laughs> But anyway, uh, keep myself fit so that when you guys, anyone wants to come with me and can't pick me up here, I'll bring the flurs, parabolic listening devices. I have a Nikon P1000 built-in telephoto lens. White man's magic, man. You can see craters on the moon. <laughs> and no offense to the listeners. I'm an Indian. Yeah, you know, and that's it. Everyone's laughing. Have a good time. That's what it's all about. You got to exactly. be like. Uh, exactly. You know, like two we gotta laugh at ourselves. Like we laugh, gotta yep. laugh at ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. But I got all the equipment, and you know, and then if, if someone wants to come, just uh, give me a shout, email me. Um, what do you call it? I'm real easy to find. Sasquatch Island on Facebook. You know, you go there, scroll, ask to join, scroll the posts, and I try to make you know every third or fourth post where I'll be talking about an expedition. I'll have my email and my cell phone on there. And then, okay. you know, get a hold of me, text me, email me, and then I'll send you a business card so you have both my Canadian and American cell phone as well as my email. And then I'll email you a links page that way instead of you calling me and going, what other podcasts are you on? Dude, I'm on like 100 podcasts. I even used to have my own podcast called Sasquatch Island on Monster X Radio. But then I got, it was just too much to always be doing podcasts. So I said, well, instead of keeping my knowledge retained, I'll just help those other people out, guys and girls that are doing their pod and video casts, and I'll just have chat, get them to get me on, and so I can chatter, chatter like a Sasquatch and help them get that in close encounter of the hairy kind. I hope, I mean, that's what it's all about, <laughs> and that's what I have all this knowledge. Like I've sprung out of a pile of alder leaves in the fall and end of October, and eyeball locked as juvenile six and a half foot. A six foot four, roughly Sasquatch juvenile trying to sneak into my camp, steal my damn garlic and apples again. When this Indian comes shooting out of that leaves and went, hey, and that Sasquatch grabbed that tree and but I pulled the tree, stepped up on the bank, turned and looked at me, and I'd turn the table on him. I put the jig on him. I bingoed him. He didn't bingo me or steal from me. So he ran off. I ran laughing, jumped in the cabin. There's my cousin with a 30-30. Pick it on the Sasquatches. I'm not picking them <laughs> on them. I'm telling them this is my turf. You don't come into our camp where we're building these cabins or raiding our food locker. I said, I'm pissing up the fence posts and showing them I can piss higher than them. That's what Bush <laughs> is all about. And that's what Sasquatches understand. Oh, that's why you always pee all around camp. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> good reason. Setting up my territory. Yeah. Inside yeah. of the forest, this is my area. So oh. after I put the jig on that 
teenage Sasquatch, I call him. The next day, we heard something, smelled something. So I'm standing there looking up the, because the alder leaves are all fallen now. I can see up the hill behind our cabins we're building for my tribe on a 250-acre Indian Reserve island of ours. So anyway, I see something, and I'm like, that doesn't look normal. I'm like, Darcy, get me the scope for my gun. I had a 3 by 9 Bushnell and a cardboard box, spare one. So he brings it out and gives it to me, and I'm like, take it out of that damn box, you idiot. And he gives it to me, and I'm like, crank it to 3 by 9 He cranks it right up to 9 and I just go like that to in the forest, and there's this big cedar stump, probably six, seven feet in diameter from when they logged it back in the early 1900s, and all the second growth hemlock and right. alders around it and i'm looking at the stump and that's when i saw it here's this bigger sasquatch leaning against the stump sitting on his ass with his arms splayed like that because you always break silhouette everyone expects to see me like that when you're looking for sasquatch you want to look for something that's different splayed out like that and that's why they're always tree peeking on you they're breaking that silhouette so you don't see a head and shoulders so oh, anyway, man. I'm seeing the Sasquatch all splayed, sitting on his butt, leaning against this cedar stump with alder leaves on top of him, like I did the night before. And all of a sudden, he just looks and he just knows he's bingoed because I'm like that. And the four of us are now looking at where he's at. He stands up, and as he stands up, he just looks at me and goes, and "Just give me that look of." You asshole. Yeah, you got me. I pissed yeah. higher up the fence post than him, and I won. <laughs> he got up, walked into the forest. I told the crew, get back to work. We don't have to worry about that Sasquatch. He's out of here. Sure enough, hell, peace was made, and our garlic and our apples weren't stolen anymore because I had put the jig on Daddy now. So Daddy had brought the juvenile in. If there's a human, I know him. He's been around here for decades. He's here every year. If you're going to be able to learn stealth and getting close to humans without being caught that's who you're going to practice on because he's got good year back when i had good year right. getting deaf but anyway he's knows his stuff so that's why he brought his young one to me to learn and i ended up putting the bingo on his son putting the bingo on dad and that's it peace has been made now in that area and it's like that and i have another kayak camp i used to use that's cabins five cabins that look like miniature longhouse big houses native orca designs i painted on the fronts uh just for the viewers that are watching i'm a native artist that's a native orca design but beautiful, my cabins beautiful. have that yeah so i used yeah. to do uh um sea kayak with whales and on eastern vancouver island so i have a uh, five cabins that are out in the middle of timbuk nowhere on the edge of johnson strait saltwater where you can see whales and cruise ships and sea lions and eagles and everything supernatural british columbia but we got chased out of there in 06 by uh three or more sasquatches they were took shaking two trees and it looked like a zombie movie, you know, ghosts when the demons vibrate real fast. That's what those yeah. two trees look like. And I'm like, ain't that much wind. That's out of the ordinary. And <laughs> I looked at my dog and I'm like, Landy, get it. And my bush dog, six years old, goes running up the rock bluff, or not bluff, but slope. Mm -hmm. Looks behind the two shaken trees and then bing, bounces off the rock slope turns 180 and there he is my big brave bush dog who takes on bears with his tail between his leg running to the dinghy and now he's in the dinghy shaking away and i'm thinking uh oh and then all of a sudden this boom 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 and this big boulder the size half the size of a vehicle rolls into my camp right at the edge of my cookhouse and i'm like get my gun my crew man my, your gun's out in the boat anchored out in the bay Oh, so no. anyway, my, me and my two workers, I got them, told them, get in that dinghy, my sister. And she's like, what is it, Tom? And she's 10 years younger than me. So she was probably in her late 20s, no, late th mid 30s. And anyway, she's all freaking out and everything. And she starts running for the um, dinghy for her, the other dinghy for her and I. And all of a sudden she looked like Jesus Christ trying to walk on water, tie tied, and she's <laughs> stumbling all the driftwood. I'm like, slow down, you're gonna break your leg or a hip. And she gets in the dinghy and then I, after I knew my two crew and my sister was in the dinghy with my big terrified dog, I got into the dinghy and we went out to the boat, untied the lines, cut the anchor line. And, but as we're doing that, you could hear the Sasquatches and see them shaking trees. Rah! They were letting it known I was not welcome there. And I just put my cabins there 
a um, couple years before. So that plan, who I hadn't heard up until then, I you know saw one one day with my son when we were building it in 04. And my son was on the beach uh, playing on the rocks. You roll over a rock, there's baby fish and baby uh, eels and uh, small crabs. Just being a five-year-old boy, having fun on the beach. And that's when my dog, Landy, short for Land Claims Treaty to Snow. Everybody lifted his leg. We <laughs> Indians are claiming it back. So his name was Land Claims, my dog, Golden Lab Cross. Anyway, Landy gets up and he just hackles up and he's looking at the bush and he's growling. He's telling me something's not good, boss, doing his job. So I put down my whatever, I think I was hammering something. I put it down anyway, grabbed my 30-30. I hit it along my right side and I walked down the beach and Landy just keeps looking up to the left part of the beach and bank of forest. And he, Landy's walking towards my son down at the water's edge and it's low tide. So he's about maybe 30 yards from me. And as we're closing distance, I look up the hill and there's this big Sasquatch standing there sideways looking at my son. And he was a big bugger and shoulders on him are just huge. And I'm just like, yo, weeks tuna. Hello, what are you up to, Sasquatch? You leave my Wisa be do alone, my little boy. He's not doing any wrong. Go on now, get out of here. And that Sasquatch just looked at me. Turned, walked away. So it's always a constant pissing battle with Sasquatches. Because they know you. They've already they put the bingo on you and done recon on you before you even saw them. They know, and the reason why they're making themselves present, they're pissing up the fence post, trying to show you who's more dominant. You got to piss back. And show them you're even more dominant. And they know you got a gun. They know you got a knife. They see you're not showing fear. As soon as you don't show fear to a Sasquatch, it tells them, better respect this hairless bipedal creature and leave them be. And that's what I've learned in the forest for decades being out there. you got to use bush code. There's a code book that's chiseled in stone on bush code and logic. And that's what I teach people. It could be in anything, like everything in the forest will get pooped out. Our job is to ensure that we don't get pooped out 20 years too early by multiple creatures. So in other words, when you go to bush, you do your, listen to your people who taught you. You read those books, watch those internet things to a certain point. A lot of those guys are just out there to left field. But anyway, learn your survival in the bush and don't be stupid. Bring a gun. You know, North America, Canada, U.S., we can have guns. Bring them, you know. You know, people go, well, I don't believe in bringing a gun. I'm like, okay, so you're in downtown urbanized suburb where you live. You got your kid. You're selling cookies for the scouts or the brownies your daughter's in. And all of a sudden you see a house that takes up the whole end of a, uh, a end of a street property. And it's got a white picket fence all the way around, a small little two-bedroom house in the middle. And it's like 30 feet from the gate to the front door. But you see a doghouse and it's empty and you see a sign that says, I love my petty pit bull, but there's no dog. Do you open the gate and go sell cookies and bang on the door? Hell no. Well, why the hell would you go to the bush when our pit bulls are usually 250 pounds to 1,200 pounds? They got claws, they got big canines, and they're omnivores. It means they'll Very eat both. anything. So. When you go in the bush, bring a bloody gun. That way I don't have to get called to go help search for you like I used to do back in the day. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to have to look for some, uh, some, uh, yeah, some, what do they call it? It was a suburbanite. Yeah, I, I understand I'm former military and uh, a lot of people are anti-gun. I'm definitely not. I'm definitely pro-gun. Um, I believe in rights and all those kind of things too. But uh, yeah, if you're going to go to a certain neighborhood, I'm also from a very dangerous city as well. So you just... You got to keep your head about you. And uh, Thomas, this has been very, very informative. And it was, it was, every interview we, we do is different. And this one is up there with the, the most fun. I'm going to say yeah. that I had entertaining and informative, entertaining and informative too. Like there was so much information you, you, you brought forward and, you know, perspective. Yeah. Perspective. I love the perspective. Absolutely love it. Is there anything that you want to push other than your website and people trying to contact you so they can do what you were describing to us that we should do? Do you have any, like, uh, you know, you said you have mugs and you have this and you have that. Is there anything that they can uh, contact you for? 
So, yeah, I work with SasquatchLegend.com, TheBigFootStore.com. I take custom orders. The best thing is email me, Tom.Seawood at gmail.com. I'm sure you'll put it up on your subtitles. But uh, join Sasquatch Island on Facebook. If you're not on Facebook, go to YouTube, and you'll see my email, and I talk about it on there as well. But, uh, yeah, T-O-M.S-E-W-I-D at gmail.com and i'll send you a links page that way you got everything you name it i'm on there you'll, you'll yeah. make you'll make you'll make okay. my job a lot easier because that's what i do i do all the links yeah, yeah. <laughs> i got some pretty cool t-shirts that uh right. west coast native sasquatch designs mainly and uh, i guess there's one of them right here this is patty 352 quack walk walk version so, i love it i love that's it that's a cool one yes cool one. <laughs> yeah and then yeah, you know, and then, you know, get me back on again. I'm sure now your listeners, you know, what we're going to talk about is uh, the third indigenous tribe of uh, the United States and the fourth indigenous tribe recognition for Canada, Sasquatch. And the next podcast, we'll talk about that and we'll get into all of the conspiracy stuff. Really give us some entertainment. 100%. Awesome. Yeah. Thomas, we are open to everything. Conspiracy, UFOs. The little people you were talking about, yes. that, that's something that's been coming up more and more. Like here in Mexico, they have the, they call them Aleutias, which are like the yeah. little the little people. And it is in this area that we are, it is rife with stories. Right. There's so many. So it's extremely interesting. I definitely, we well, we definitely yeah. want yes. you, definitely want you back, Thomas. Yeah, I had a run in with uh, Bacuas, that's what we call them. Behind me in uh, my regalia lockers because when we do performance we got the west coast mask carved and fur and cost outfits called regalia i don't mm -hmm. we don't use the term costume but anyway the regalia that i have are of chunach a sasquatch i got two masks i can show that next time and then i have Bukwis, the little people that comes out in the beaches at night looking at you <laughs> wow as Are he's you using his feet to dig Are for you? shellfish yeah, Tom, don't don't yeah. uh, you set me up for a good time, Tom. That sounds that sounds incredible. We, oh we yeah, appreciate, anytime. We appreciate you having you on, uh, and thank you so very much for coming on. Yeah. So, uh, so Thomas, th again, thank you so much for coming on. We're just going to put you into our green room. I want you to stay there just to the end of the podcast, just to make sure we have the full recording. Uh, so it might be an extra five minutes. All right. Sure. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much, thank Thomas. So much, it was fantastic. <laughs> All right, that was that was Thomas Seawood. That was so much information. I could listen to him for hours. He has such a great, uh, such a great manner manner about him. It just yes. makes you feel his, his, comfortable and his, welcoming and warm. Yeah, his humor and but his information as well. Loved yeah. it. Things I've never heard before or perspectives that maybe you guys would be interested in. And I, I really enjoyed it. And I, I'm right. we really enjoyed it. And we hope you enjoy it as well. So thanks for watching the show. And. Your sign off. What's my sign off? Yes. Beyond the proof. Welcome to. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Lost Frequency Podcast, where we bring the periphery into focus. We close with good night, good luck, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Freedom.